All right. Hello and welcome to another AI Green Lab session brought to you by YME Bahamas and the Bahamas UNESCO National Commission. We are so excited to be continuing this conversation where we're learning more about artificial intelligence and how it can be a tool in our lives, um, but then also gaining awareness of where the challenges may be or where there may be opportunity for us to um, take a pause and reflect on you know, the impacts of AI, positive, negative, and otherwise. Um, and I know I've been deep in reflection these past uh, few weeks, and especially today, just thinking about how I think artificial intelligence is really going to be um, just transforming how we learn, transforming how we operate in the world. So I'm really excited to dive into tonight's conversation. I think Abby has a really great lineup of um, subject and content for us to review. So Abby, I'm gonna pass the floor on to you and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Nikita. All right, can you see my screen? All right. Okay, I think it's on full screen now. All good? Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, warm greetings to you all. Uh, welcome to the AI Green Lab. Uh, it's a webinar series where we're talking about artificial intelligence and smart development. And uh, we're very happy that um, this, uh, we'd like to first thank Nikita's team um, at the YME, uh, Young Marine Explorers Bahamas, and also the UNESCO National Commission of the Bahamas for allowing us to have this, uh, powering this conversation uh, of um, uh, particularly about AI and how it applies for smart development and uh, all things good, green and blue as we call it. And yeah, thank you for Nikita and the team as well for um, setting up um, the team, getting it together uh, to allowing us to also share the experience between two different regions uh, um, and two different peoples at the same time. And a few housekeeping rules, uh, maybe a few points of information. Uh, uh, feel free, this is an open learning space. Feel free to drop any of your questions on the chat box. Uh, any any questions or comments you may have, you can drop them on the chat box. We'll make sure to return back to them later on. Um, and of course, uh, if you haven't joined us on the WhatsApp group, the AI Green Lab WhatsApp group, feel free to join. Um, I'll just drop the, uh, we've shared the uh, WhatsApp group link on the emails we've sent. Uh, but if not, we'll also make sure to share them on the chat box. Uh, so yeah, my name is, uh, for those who might be uh, getting to know me for the first time, my name is Abby Shumelis. Uh, you can just simply call me Abby. I'm a projects communication lead at the Economic Commission for Africa at the Digital Center for Excellence on Digital ID, Trade and Economy. Uh, we just call it short DIET, DIET for Africa. Uh, so I'm uh, very much interested in the nexus of sustainability and tech governance, uh, where we mostly explore the application of emerging emerging technologies and the application of uh, sustainable development. So I'm passionate about the environment and at the same time, interested in how technology applies to fast track our sustainable development goals. So... The whole objective of this AI Green Lab is really about uh, understanding these two uh, seismic global shifts, as they call them, uh, is to have a deeper understanding of both our ecological and digital transformation goals. So uh, just to maybe recap for those of you joining us here for the first time, uh, this is our fourth session. Uh, the AI Green Lab is a conceptualization of the uh, foundational understanding of both uh, technology and our ecological transformation. And it's been bringing young Bahamians uh, from all walks of life and backgrounds to discuss and learn about AI, 
its social impact and practical of application of AI itself, whether if you're from Cat Island or Nassau or uh, different parts of the Caribbean community and the islands. So everyone is welcome, uh, irrespective of where you are, uh, what you're doing and your interest, as long as the, uh, it combines the um, interest of the environment and technology, how technology applies, that's a great thing. Um, so th this, this AI Green Lab is also bringing um, together uh, communities from different parts and perspectives of the world. Uh, we have extended invites to our brothers and sisters here in Ethiopia. I'm currently based here in Addis. It's actually 2.30 a.m. And uh, we it's not only about learning a thing or two about AI, but it's also about uh, connecting two different uh, communities and uh, with technology and the ecology and our environment being a common place for action. So that is basically the um, um, the so so the underlining principles of this co-creation, and uh, just to give you a quick uh, summary overview. Um, so session one so far we had about uh, we had three sessions. This is the fourth. Uh, the first session uh, dealt with offered a foundational uh, understanding of AI and covering the process of how we acquire intelligence basically what is intelligence well this allowed us to appreciate the power of data and how the small we had our guest speaker uh, Dagmai Badulu uh, game thinker and software designer uh, here in Ethiopia who took us through an informative session on uh, on how data typically evolves from simple qualitative bits of, uh, and notes to further be processed to higher forms of uh, information, knowledge, insight, and wisdom. Uh, second session mostly dealt with the social impacts of AI. And um, here, the session emphasized the need for data to tell more. How do we tell more uh, powerful and inclusive uh, and in inclusive stories that represent our reality and the social impacts as it relates to jobs being dis displaced and also jobs being created. Here, as you can see, the figures estimate by 2030, we might have 400 to 800 million jobs being displaced. But at the same time, it's not just about jobs being displaced. It's also about the opportunities uh, for new jobs to be created. So it's both ways. It can go both ways. And actually, we had last week an interesting session about the practical application of future opportunities of AI on our third session, which Glenys, uh, who is um, uh, who who shared with us an interesting presentation. Glenys is uh, also a guest speaker from last week. She uh, uh, she 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 specializes on AI and climate science, and it, her presentation was particularly interesting on how we can move from consumer to creator. You know, how does the local applications of AI translate to everyday Bahamians, uh, and particularly for small island communities, and whether if you're in developing communities as well. Um, in general, um, there's so many that the applications are vast, whether if you're in health, transport, communication, education, there's a lot to uh, unpack in there, but the bottom line is there's a need to integrate skills, particularly digital uh, skills, training across all of these sectors, and also get that preparation going for the new types of jobs that are being created. Um, so there's a lot uh, to discuss here, but we kind of extended the... Uh, conversation now further on today's session, um, which is also an extension of the practical applications of AI, but also exploring the human versus technology uh, relationships. And also, secondly, today we also want to discuss what, how can we be more proactive and become aware of the unintended consequences of AI and emerging uh, technologies before we actually dive into the uh, practical applications in terms of, uh, yes, these are good technologies we can utilize quickly, uh, 
Um, but we need to also do that in a way that it's, uh, we're cognizant of the unintended consequences and also uh, making sure that we are supplementing the human, the higher human essence of ourselves. Um, making sure that we don't uh, uh, just leave everything for the machine to learn things and then we become too dependent. So there's this parasitic and then uh, parasitic host relationships that uh, some some interesting uh, researchers explain about. And for that, uh, to really dive deeper into this human technology relationship, uh, I, I would be really happy to share with you uh, today's uh, topic video uh, subject that we're going to be discussing. I'm going to, uh, this video actually is uh, courtesy of uh, the Global uh, Flourishing Conference in which they are in one of their sessions about AI. It's a recent video from, I think, two weeks ago, not so long ago. So um, it's from the Global Tendencies Foundation. So we're gonna be sharing this video quickly. It's a 10 minute uh, conversation about this human technology nexus. And I'd really love for us if we can uh, take a moment of reflection over the after the video, and then we can later on uh, do our second session. We're gonna have a, a conversation about uh, this human technology relationship and how, uh, which errors we need to be very careful or like pay attention to. So I'll just uh, stop the uh, screen sharing here and then go on to the video. The $10 million fund is dedicated to supporting startups committed to targeting negative effects of technology. It is not just a fund, but rather a movement spanning business, academia, government creation. Of the so the, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see the screen? This is uh, where the video starts, and then uh, we'll recap later on after this. In this 10 minute talk, I'm going to deepen our awareness on the issue. I'll then talk about a certain parasitic relationship that has formed between man and digital technologies. From there, I will speak to the current band-aids that are being implemented. In the fourth section, we'll delve into the bona fide solution. And finally, we'll see how what was once deemed a problem has become an incredible opportunity. So beyond the talk, deepening our awareness. I want to begin by speaking to some of the many characteristics of the human soul. Our humanity, our essence, is the source of inspiration, creativity, community, and here I'll relabel that as community. Our essence is nurturing, active, and it is whole. Now the reason why we so often fail to commune with our deeper essence is because we often separate from our humanity through various thought patterns of the mind. In effect, when we are attached to these thought patterns, we eclipse the essence dimension. To name a few, thought patterns are rational, pragmatic, binary, analytical, systematic, and data bound. When we're attached to the lower dimension of rationality, the essence dimension, the dimension of the soul, is deemed irrationality, a.k.a. woo-woo. Where the lower dimension is mechanical, the higher dimension is natural. Where the lower dimension is intellect, the higher dimension is intelligence. If we were to place digital technology into this framework, it clearly resides in the lower dimension. And this would have to be, as technology itself is born of the rational human mind. So what we have here are three players. We have the totality of the self, 
which includes thought patterns of the mind, if and when we choose to use them. We have attachment to thought patterns, which forms a separate self. And we have technology pegged to the lower dimension. To get a sense of the energies at play, we need to get to know the separate self. Let's first take a look at its behavioral patterns. If, in the essence dimension, we are surrounded in inspiration, then when we have separated from that, we behave in patterns of repetition. When we separate from creativity, we live in imitation. When we separate from community, we live as individualistic. When we separate from nurturing, we become abusive. When we separate from the active, we become reactive. When we separate from wholeness, we become fragmented and take sides. When we look at any of the globe's current regions of unrest, we can be sure the separate self is alive and thriving. Let's now take a look at emotional patterns of the separate self. When we are separated from inspiration, then our emotional state is one of dullness. When we separate from creativity, our emotional state is one of boredom. When we separate from community, we enter isolation and loneliness. When we separate from nurturing, we feel abandoned. When we separate from the active, we live a life of passivity. When we separate from wholeness, we experience feelings of emptiness. Now that we've gotten to know some of the many characteristics of the separate self, let's get into the problem. Those familiar with the functioning of the separate self know that it has a certain knack for creating relationships of outer dependence. And dependence on technology is no exception. Here's how it works. The exploitive patterns of technology are rooted in the vacancies of the separate self. Given an emotional pattern of dullness, technology comes to the rescue with distraction. Boredom is overcome through novelty. Loneliness overcome through virtual connection. Abandonment overcome through validation. Passivity overcome through entertainment. Emptiness overcome through virtual fulfillment. So in a sense, we've created an artificial life that feeds off the vacancies of the separate self. What is created is a parasite and host relationship. Make no mistake, this parasite host analogy has not only manifested in the psyche, but is currently being manifested physically in the form of brain computer implants, where a digital parasite enters the host brain. From a spiritual point of view, we are robbing ourselves of inner evolution. To be sure, watch how the outer device mimics the essence dimension. Distraction is the lower frequency of inspiration. Virtual novelty is the lower frequency of creativity. Virtual connection is the lower frequency of community. Validation is the lower frequency of nurturing. Entertainment is the lower frequency of the active. And virtual fulfillment is the lower frequency of wholeness. Instead of rising vertically in the realization of self, we are depending on the machine to do it for us. Without this higher awareness of the issue, all efforts to rebalance risk to throw us even more off balance. And this brings us to the current solutions being practiced. Uh-oh. Currently, there is an incredible amount of resources being spent on government regulation, device education and responsibility, and increased pressure to change the big tech business model. There is also money going directly into technology in an attempt to make the parasite less parasitic. What we are essentially doing is creating a barrier of protection from the parasite. But this is just a repellent. And although the repellent is important, it is not a cure. Why? Because it is the disposition of the host that seeds the problem to begin with. It is here where a higher awareness is so critical. Because although the repellent may be well-intentioned, it risks to backfire. AI for Good initiatives are perhaps the best example of this. Billions of dollars are being spent on more compassionate, empathetic, 
and loving AI. But compassion, empathy, and love are the essence of the human soul. To attempt to program AI with these virtues is to attempt to give the machine a soul, but an artificial soul at best. To the unaware human, this only increases the power of the parasite. Our counter to this increase in power is more money invested in the repellent. And this is clearly not a solution, as the more compassionate AI becomes, the more dependent the host becomes. We need a cure. I'm here to introduce a new life-calling impact model. All right, I think we'll stop there before we get into other people's solution. Um, but I think it will be a nice moment to kind of pause here and then um, think about, there's a lot of concepts uh, shared on that video. Uh, some of them, which I've tried to note, or like they, you have this parasite host relationship that has been repeatedly mentioned. You also have the um, the the higher essence of the human higher essence that we we try to achieve as human beings. The more that's the more desirable form of our being, but also we are subject to our thought patterns and also emotional behavior which are operating at the lower realm and then you have technology feeding off these vacuums that typically um, dwell on the lower realms of our human um, as human human uh, progress but not really capitalize on the higher level of human function so um let me not uh, dive too deep before like hearing other people's opinion uh, Let's hear from the audience and see what are your thoughts. Uh, so, for example, um, how do you see the relationship between human and te technology so far? Um, and from the video and the explanation we've heard, which ones relate to you mo most? Uh, just to guide maybe this conversation, uh, maybe I can just share you this uh, few highlights from the video. Mm, just a sec. So these are like the the core areas of discussion the video dives into. You have the upper essence of ourselves, the lower thought patterns and emotional patterns. So yeah, um, let's talk about these terms a bit. We can take a few moments here. Maybe Abby, we can do a round robin um, <clears throat> because that video I mean, I've watched that video now. This is my third or maybe fourth time watching that video. And I still felt that it was a lot to take in. So if it was your first time tuning in, um, I think it is good to to talk and reflect more on that. Um, but I, before we do that, maybe we could just let everyone just um, open their mic and just sort of share what your understanding or reflection is at this point in this conversation, knowing that there's no real right or wrong here. We're just trying to understand together. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Um, From my understanding, at least I don't understand too much of the video, to be honest. But um, I think, Abby, you were asking about how technology um, play a role in our life, which is so funny because, like, I, I, I have my phone. It's like I'm attached to my phone and subconsciously, and I don't even know it. It's like, oh, um, what is this plus this? Oh, I just pick up my phone. 
oh, what is the definition of this word? I just go on Google, you know, and it's like we are dependent on our phone and we don't even know it. Like we don't even take the time on to even like think about it because it's just subconsciously we just pick up the phone I'm like oh I, I'll look it up for you one moment and I think technology is like I said in the last um session I think it's good and I think it's bad I think it's good because it we could use it as a tool to help us to connect with people from all walk of life but then also in a bad way it's like we are dependent on it and not even knowing it per se mm. thank you so much anthony for sharing that so just to where would you what you've described now anthony's uh you said mm -hmm. you, you know this regular checking of your phone in which emotional patterns or thought patterns would you categorize um this 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 observation of yourself which you mean like what on um, the board? Yeah, from, you can see my uh, shared screen. Yeah. Um. Okay. Certainly, she, I don't yeah. think not abusive. Not abusive mm -hmm. for sure. Um. I don't know. What does repetition Dominance. mean? Re uh, repetition yeah. maybe a sent a pattern in which you subconsciously repeat things without being necessarily intentional about them. Um, I don't know, maybe if checking phones regularly could be seen as a repetition or a sense of boredom. Or, uh, I think a, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think that would, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit. Of, so I'll have to say repetition um, is one of them for sure. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. You're so welcome. All right. Anyone else? Nope. Shuri? Um, I guess I can jump in. Um, or Jade? Yeah. Yeah. So just going through and um, seeing how they would connect the essence with thought and emotion patterns. A lot of alarm bells went off in my head because I'm like oh my gosh I'm on social media so often and I see some of the patterns negative patterns showing up um, boredom repetition dullness passivity etc so uh, it was really insightful to get that perspective um, of what consistently interacting with the AI really can, the impact that it can have on us today. But um, to jump further, I am wondering if as they developed the algorithm to be more acutely specific to human interaction, whether we will see more examples of the higher self showing up in the way that AI interacts with us, primarily because it's responding to whatever we feed into it. I mean, we can talk about that more in depth, I guess, but it, I'm curious to know if that's something that could develop over time. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Shade. Yeah, ideally, we do want to tap into that upper uh, essence of our human self. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's thank you for also sharing what you've noticed uh, in your usage pattern of these technologies. But also, um, out of these, the ones that are labeled in red, which ones would you say, for example, talking about loneliness and individualistic. Now it's talking about, I think, the coming together of people or like the separation of people, right? So is this something that we would relate um, when it comes to the usage of technologies? Um, 
So far, yes. Uh, from Anthony's response and Jade, I've picked up repetition, boredom, passivity, as some of the observed uh, thought and emotional patterns, which technology might capitalize on. Maybe if we can get a few examples on the others, maybe that would be nice. Jay, did you have a follow-up? Uh, he mentioned my name earlier and I wasn't sure if he was speaking with me directly. Um, but I guess I can add to that as well, maybe with the imitation aspect, especially now that people are considering AI is a, a tool to be used more for creativity um, purposes. I think the line of that kind of gets blurred <laughs> as to mm. what we can define as our own creation if we're using programmable tool. I don't know exactly where the boundary Excellent. of that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, it came up in our last discussion last week, uh, in which, you know, all of a sudden, people got really good at writing, right? Like when they use these kind of um, tools to kind of, you know, you see everyone on social media using these uh, AI generated content, and it kind of misses out on the tone of that person, the genuine creativity you see now creativity came up from the upper essence of the the blue section of the this this higher self right so yes absolutely imitation versus and then the opposite being creativity in which we need to tap further into so any other example maybe we before i i kind of wanted to spend a little bit time here because it's really at the bedrock of our conversation of how we see AI and technology in general apply to, to facilitate and to support some of our, you know, higher essence goals, which is to inspire, to be creative, to come together, to nurture, to be active, and all of those things that listed on the top. So, Nikita, you have any anything to share on here? Uh, so at I, this point before we move to the next was interesting and just to build off of jade's comment you know just looking at if um imitation is mm. the lower frequency of creativity in this example um you know even just thinking about how i've been leaning more and more into various ai tools as i've been going about my day and I'm noticing the limitations, right? And I think this was something that Glenice brought up that, you know, while the AI can script like a really good sentence, like grammar is wonderful, you know, in many cases, um, it's limited by the data points that you are, how you're guiding it. And um, I think that there is, I think if you're using various AI tools as sort of a support to your creative process, you know, then that's great. But I think when, um, if we are just depending on AI to do the thinking, I think we're misguided because AI can't really think. It just kind of organizes information that it has access to and the discretion that comes from, I think, the the human being in the equation is not accessible through AI. Um, but just also just looking into the thought pattern versus emotion patterns, you know, and the idea of like I see it with the repetition completely. I pick up my phone and mm. it's I go I do a loop between Instagram, Facebook, my email repeat Instagram, Facebook, my email. And it's not even like, it's it's completely subconscious at this point. You know, I just will pick up my phone. And even when I'm not, I don't have internet service, right? For whatever reason, BTC or whatever is not working. Um, I still see myself 
picking up my phone to do the same loop, even though I cannot access new information because I am disconnected from the, the internet at the time. Um, so that is something that I have noticed about myself from a repetition. And it's kind of re repetition is done from, I guess, this idea of, you know, dullness, boredom, you want to see something new, right? So you're like going back to your phone to like see something new. That in essence should yeah. inspire, but maybe it doesn't. It doesn't exactly hit, hit the mark. It does actually. It's um, it's because these words would would mean nothing if we don't associate them to our real life examples, right? Because that's why I'm kind of spending a, a little bit more time here. And absolutely, this repetition, the imitation, these things you have mentioned, they are uh, usually emotional thought patterns at this realm, the lower frequencies of, of where technology can come in to fill up the void of, of these, um, the voids created by these thought and emotional patterns. And maybe to just give an example on individualistic and loneliness um, patterns, I think that's one I would say you can you can relate it and how um, let's say you're texting you you're in a meeting where you're actually you're in a meeting full of people let's say 200 300 people but still you are plugged into your chat maybe you're talking to someone on the other end of the chat and not really being present during that um, you know which again can relate to wholeness and also being fragmented you are there physically but you are kind of fragmented and working on an individual state of uh, operation so i mean there's a lot of, of examples we can relate to but at the bottom line is to is to really understand the humanity and technology interaction and how we are getting uh how we're getting along so far in this interaction so in 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 our understanding of these exploitive patterns of technology this is what it's being termed in the explanation uh, of the video is that there's exploitive patterns of technology that normally the how the engineers design them um, it doesn't necessarily have to be always like that but it's typically we're saying typically technology uh, fill out this 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 uh, void of dullness, boredom, loneliness, abandonment, passivity, emptiness. These are usually filled by technologies, and these are things we need to be aware of when talking about the practical applications and future opportunities about AI. So that's what the the separate self being the host and technology being the parasite relationship is used as an analogy during the presentation. Um, in, in, in this awareness is when we can now say, ah, okay, I'm actually, I can actually use this for better usage. Maybe instead of repeating the same things, I might just use it to prompt and give me some structure and outlines about my creative process, my creative thinking process, and then I can apply my own personal touch to it. So you kind of gauge yourself in this um, in this uh, I would say spectrum of uh, human creative creativity, or you might say um, different levels of pot human potential, and recognizing where technology comes in as a parasite instead of as a supplement is when uh, we can become more aware of the of uh, the its better potentials of usage. Um, lastly, on this video, uh, on the subject of this video, the, um, at some point there is a mention about the repellent, right? Maybe I'd like to pause a little bit here. Um, and talk about this repellent. So far, we talked about the host, us, and our lower self. We talked about the parasite, the, the technology being the parasite. We talked about the upper self, 
the higher essence of the soul. And then there was a mention about the repellent, about these temporary band-aids or like fixes uh, that the global community is making to make these technologies safer. So they kind of designed it as this barriers, right? Like uh, two wall barriers, and then you have some dollar sign in between. So let's talk about about these repellents. How 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 did we understand them? Or have you found any examples of these repellents? Or like a buffer zone for the technology usage and how it affects us? Can I ask a question on this? So my understanding was that the um, when they're talking about the repellents, um, they're speaking about solutions that are being proposed to try and help people become more aware of AI. So is that is that correct in in other people's understanding of what they were saying and it am i understanding that it is mm -hmm. what is the what is the repellent as opposed to what i guess that's what i'm like i'm understanding that our sort of obsession with ai could very easily take us into you know a spiral and i think what the speaker was trying to share is that to try and remember that there's levels to this situation and that like AI can only ever be AI because AI is not a human being, right? And AI sort of regurgitates information and compiles information based on various data points that it has access to, but it doesn't have the ability to create in the way that a human being can create. You know, it can mimic um, and then, of course, it can learn our ways of like what we have preferences. And so it can feed us what it is that we like. And I guess this is where those lower those two things uh, that that previous slide was sort of talking about what are the. When we're not aware that the machine has learned our behavior and is then giving us information or is interacting with us just as we are sort of blindly kind of consuming. Um, you know, I feel like that is sort of one of the points that he was getting at. And then sort of the contrast being, if we are creating a new, if we want to create awareness about these challenges. But my biggest takeaway, I think, was that there's, what he's saying based on human beings having souls and a machine being a machine that as smart or as as much intelligence or information that this machine can acquire it can never operate on the level of nurturing and creativity and you know these other components that define you know a human's essence mm. Yeah, so uh, the way I understood it, at least these repellents, I mean, we, we can have more uh, thoughts from the house, maybe if any, uh, but I'll also answer your question, Nikita, yeah, on how I understood it. Okay. Uh, do you mind if I throw a monkey wrench? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, Um. so this this concept of creativity is really throwing me. Okay, so I'll give an example. We assume that creativity is inherently a human trait based on the way that we've designed our language. But what would you say to an elephant that recognizes symbols and can paint? Like, where is the boundary of what is imitation relative to creativity is it all about unique thought is it the capacity to do things in a physical sense um without previous stimuli like what exactly are we defining as creative you could say a two-year-old 
is not creative because they're imitating everything around them, but it's also how we learn language and are able to mm. pick up on other more subtle cues. So like, where is the boundary exactly of that? Mm. Very interesting question, yeah. All right, so maybe I'll just top on Jade because that's a very, I need to build up on that last question because especially on how infants mimic their parents to learn language is actually part of a repetition process. And also uh, just an elephant drawing something random um, could be considered a cre something creative or not, can be arguable, but in my, in my understanding, creativity is something that is out of the mundane and out of the learned and the mimicking, out of the mimicking process, we, we develop a sense of authenticity from our own ideas that are ideas generated from your own self. And I think that's what usually creativity means. It, it's in order for something to to be to be said creative, and doesn't necessarily need to be attractive attractive to everyone, or it doesn't need to be appealing for everyone. But there needs to be some level of authenticity that is coming from that individual, or some kind of intentional uh, thought put to for creation, right? So it's not something random. There's some thoughts put into it, and also there's some level of authenticity. If 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 ask it to repeat that same uh, process of cr creativity, that person should be able to um, to respond and uh, do the same level of creation, right? Uh, so it's not something random, and also definitely it's not something mundane. It's, so that's how I understand creativity. And it's interesting how you, you mentioned children mimicking their parents' language, right? And that's exactly how in session one, that's what we understood. That's what we were discussing. The language, the machine basically learns like an infant, picking up on patterns, language patterns, and then suggesting and predicting for you. And that's when the imitation comes and if we fall into this parasitic and host relationship and that's where these repellents cannot be able to uh do much because for example i'll give you for to answer nikita's question like um, um an example of this band-aids or repellents could be maybe a time limit on your social media usage maybe let's say you've put um six hours limit or like two hour i don't know one hour limitation for your per, per 24 hours social media usage and maybe that might be one repellent but it doesn't really address the core issues of your relationship with the technology right or maybe it could be filters like ai generated filters in which um you block off contents that are not uh, suitable for a certain viewership or a certain age limit or the AIs when they are, get perfected they can be used to these goods right but still the question remains have we got to the core issue of our relationship with technology and ourselves um, so that is we might have these bandages and uh, filters and then we might be investing a good lot on in them but still, you're going to continue using these repetitive patterns, the social media or whatever it is. We're still missing out on the upper realm of our creativity and, you know, everything mentioned on the upper realm of the higher self. So let me pause here and see if there is any I'd thoughts on the ideas here. Yeah. Three. We haven't heard from you yet. Yes. Um. Okay with the child they learn from their parents but that's just their foundation they evolve mm -hmm. to something else they evolve to create to becoming creative that's the way what i think of it. it's not just mimicking mm -hmm. they need to mm -hmm. learn from some some form of base and that's the parents but eventually they 
they become themselves. With the AI, like Abby was just saying, it is information that is feed into the AI and then he try or then it tried to predict from I guess from viewing like how Nikita was saying her regular routine mm. and I wanted to ask the question like on my computer if I if I link into tiny homes one time, tiny homes come up every day I go, whether I, I feed that in or not. The, the commercial or the ad come in, tiny homes, tiny homes. So with human, I don't think we're imitators like that. I think we evolve to individual creativity. Mm. I don't know if that made any sense, but that's how I feel. Absolutely. Absolutely, Sherry. We I definitely took on the note you said we we're not born to be to imitate. And also there is a level of uh evolution in our learning in kids in how they just as you said from just learning to mimic the words from their parents, they actually create a sense of uh, their own level of creativity as later on uh, as they grow up. And that's true. And basically, and um, I definitely took um, that from, this is what I wanted to discuss um, actually when when we're talking about these thoughts in emotional patterns, I want I wanted us to connect them to to our everyday life and what resonates, what we identify as repetitive, dull, and also uh, imitative, repetitive, so that we can be aware on how the technology basically uses these voids and then how basically it's easy to imitate and uh, become bored or dull because it's every it might be everywhere and it kind of capitalizes on these mass critical mass numbers right that's where the revenues are actually generated so that's another topic for another day but uh i'm really glad that we have come to this common understanding like uh, we have identified some of these patterns and and how um it relates to the lower realm of uh, our creativity. But now moving on to the next conversation. Now, if we say AI is the new electricity, let's say if we are saying um, electricity has transformed industries, transportation, many sectors. Now AI will bring about an equal, equally relevant, right? Equally relevant and big transformation. If this is one of the common understandings we've been having so far, we recognize this potential to transform a lot of things, uh, but at the uh, so um, the concept of leapfrog has been repeatedly coming and showing up in the conversations, especially for AI for developing countries. Um, so this this sketch, for example, shows you know like the typical ladder is in which the first communities like there's an agrarian community later the agrarian agriculture based communities level up to become a more manufacturing communities and then later on a knowledge based economy and then there's a whole progression going about that so until this whole conversation about ai and um, you know the knowledge economy came about tendency for countries to follow this growth trajectory was pretty much the same so now when when we're talking about the leapfrogging effect of ai and these emerging technologies we're talking about uh so let's say mobile phones and mobile payments like now there these two examples showed up because it's very important historically i'll give you an example in the united states the phone 
the phone coverage usually used to be the through wired phones, right? Uh, most people used to have phones, cable phones in their homes, in their offices, until they no longer became relevant when, um, you know, when mobile phones came about. In Africa and in, in most Asian countries, however, landline and phone coverage was very limited. It was very limited. So when the ICT and infrastructure developments picked up, at some point we didn't need to roll out landlines into our offices. In fact, because the mobile technology, the mobile phones became already advanced, we had to leapfrog that development stage in which we needed to open up the grounds, bury wires underground. And while, at the, while the US and Europe actually had to do that because they're already going through that evolution of their own. But for Asian and other emerging economies, African and Asian emerging economies, uh, there was some opportunity to leapfrog, jump this process and just go directly to mobile phone payments. And in fact, it didn't even just stay there. Even credit card payments, like card payments, were, became not that much necessary at this point in Asia and Africa because it's now the payment system is going through mobile payment systems. So you might not necessarily be too worried about uh, ATMs or like rolling out uh, credit cards and debit cards. So just giving you the concept of leapfrogging, right? Because this is very central to our other ongoing conversations. I'll just pause here um, and le the, let's talk about leapfrogging effect of AI first before we talk about the other applications of AI. One of them is AI for communication. This is one of the leapfrogging areas that we we really want to focus during this AI and Green Lab uh, co-creation experiment. And as we, uh, even after these sessions finish off, some of the things we want to discuss and uh, have follow-up projects on is to really, how do we green our education? And in fact, in the COP meetings recently, there's been a lot of talk that the largest green job is gonna be actually education. Uh, teaching on education, like the whole way we learn about our environment and the whole education system needs to change. If if that's what we, if that's the objective, then where does AI come in? Where does AI come in in facilitating virtual teams? In the picture, you see uh, the physical meeting of uh, <laughs> this group, Jade, I see over there, uh, Brandon, and then, but we're still continuing this process to learn uh, and exchange ideas virtually. But beyond the Zoom and beyond the um, technologies that you know virtual team meetings can offer, what does AI facilitate in communication is some of the uh, conversations we would like to have. But before going there, let me pause here and talk about AI in communication. I know Jade, for example, you're keen into data and geospatial information. We'll come to that with one of the three focus areas. One is in communication, second in data collection and processing, and third, the arts, creative, and and um, the AI's application in maintaining knowledge, knowledge preservation. But since communication is also very common for all of us, I know she, uh, Anthony has a lot of ideas on communication. So we want to build up that conversation first, and then we can go on um, to data, uh, AI for data. So I'll ask, what is the most urgent and interesting applications in communication? What do we ideally want to, picking up from the conversation we had earlier about inspired inspiration, creativity, wholeness, you know, all of those good upper uh, selves, where do we see communication uh, coming in there? How would we ideally want to communicate? I'm, I'm still figuring this all out, but I'm seeing how AI can really revolutionize our thought process. Um, 
I remember I had a teacher once, I think I said this earlier, Abby, but I had a teacher once that um, told me it didn't really matter how much I memorized as long as I knew where to get that information. You know, and I think mm -hmm. it, when we think about like sort of your, your grade school education experience, a lot of that was like rote memorization. And that would make sense at a time where you didn't have the internet, you know, where we needed to like store all this knowledge, if you will, in our brains. Um, but what I'm observing about AI is that AI has the ability to process much larger amounts of information in smaller periods of time than I could myself consume right by myself but by by utilizing ai to help gather sort of key knowledge touch points i think it allows us to when we speak um to speak with sort of more breadth or depth than we would normally have been able to just because we have access to um the information processing power that AI offers. So I think if people really were to embrace AI, but I think it had to be, it would have to be coupled with critical thinking because artificial intelligence in the absence of critical thinking, I think is hugely dangerous because you're just taking it blindly, whatever the machine generates. Um, and that, as we've discussed previously, has all sorts of spinoffs from misinformation and, and, and. Um, mm. But I can see how AI could create sort of this new dimension of human processing, where it's kind of this fusion of, um, of the power of the AI processing intertwined with human sort of creativity and ingenuity. Hmm. Yes, that is correct. Um, and in fact, that is what's at the core of the the push, like the global push for AI for good concepts. And you know, like when we talk about creativity, like so in fact, someone was saying we don't need more browsers, for example, you don't need to invent. Uh, a new Chrome or a new Microsoft search engine already that has been perfected to a certain level. Now the question is about what type of information you want to search and how you can have more representative information to search to begin with. So which kind of brings us to one of the practical applications of AI and communication is you have these newly emerging assistive search browsers or AI powered browsers. Like for example, here in the example, you have the uh, Copilot, they, they named it Copilot. It's one of Microsoft's um, chat engine. In fact, when you search certain uh, concepts, it's, it's, it's actually, um, it's, it's, it's real time. I mean, you can have a look at it. There's a lot of functionalities about it. It's basically, it's an AI companion for the web that can help you create, learn, and and more, according to them. So it's more, it uses natural language to do amazing things as they market it. But basically, there's many, many applications um, of this kind of extension. They're actually AI extension tools. We've been mentioning them last time. Um, you said your teacher, Nikita, was saying, it doesn't matter how much information you consume or memorize. In fact, even when we were learning, uh, there is to be a lot of, pressure on uh, memorizing things, which um, I don't know if really if helped uh, expand our memory section of our brain. I don't know, but it's it was kind of unproductive when you kind of look at it. Yeah. Look at it now. Um, even even back in a few centuries, like a few centuries back, literacy, like the ability to read books was only limited to a certain amount of people like the, the, the priests or the those in the clergy area right those are the ones that read out what ha whatever has been written by law or by the religious leaders to the mass 
and literacy was not really considered a, a very much needed <laughs> a very much needed skill until the industrial revolution came and then finally it was beneficial for a lot of people to actually go to school and have basic literacy because eventually we realized we will have much more richer life if all people could read and guess what we are at that transition also heading into the ai era or like this digital era now there is more need for people to be literate in using these AI tools without necessarily being coders. You don't need to be a coder to, um, just a few years back, there was a lot of emphasis. So, okay, you don't know how to code. Okay, then you're going to miss out a lot of things, but not anymore. Not a lot of people, not everyone knows how to code or wants to even code. I personally don't want to code, but I just want to use these tools to actually a must. For example, you have these chat GPT tools for YouTube summary videos, right? But again, they have their own limitations. There are some details and undertones that you miss in trying to get these summaries. And they're usually, uh, um, for the first part, they're free, but later on, they ask you for premium subscriptions and those kind of things. Will we ever get to a point where these things will be more equitable and uh, accessible for for all of us? Time will tell. But as of now, there are tools being perfected for different writers, students, people who are doing knowledge work to kind of use AI, AI supported um, citation tools um, and also summary tools but also in general, um, in building a global virtual team, so as in our case, like um, what would we ideally want to see AI come in to support these gaps is one of the questions we'd like to explore deeper in this um, AI Green Lab co-creation uh, activities. So before going to data, uh, AI for data, Let's pause here. So any thoughts, comments on uh, AI for communication? I know there's vast applications. These are just a few examples we also mentioned last week. Um, yeah. Antonise, did you have any thoughts? I know communication is sort of one of your areas. How are we on time, by the way? Um, I think we have about 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, Jader Shereed. Abby, you said um, maybe back in the day where we had to remember or, yeah, you know, we had to remember a whole lot of um, information question do you think the ai is causing us to be more selfish in the way or the example where instead of me going to another person for information i could just pull it up online or wherever the um the portal is to retain information hmm. A uh, short answer would be, this is one of the ways we need to be mindful of the gaps, you know, the voids that we assume AI might fill. And I think this is also a question about the issue of wholeness and community and fragmented communities, right? So uh, in a sense, it does, I think, it will definitely, we miss out. Uh, the best way I would put it is we might be missing out on certain added values of human interaction if we become too dependent on information that has been pre-fed 
priority biased institutions or yep. learning patterns and um you know this kind of process so absolutely the sh um, absolutely and in fact this is at the core of what we want to raise awareness is that how do we perfect the way we learn even how do we by greening the education by uh, even the the term when we're greening our education uh, as associating greening to become something that is uh, nurturing something that's flourishing that's something more progressive um if we have to give it a color and if we call it just green and, and I don't want to be biased too much and i know maybe blue might be also the a good way to put it anyways green and blue whatever you call it but what would be a very progressive way of learning and how do we make it easier for people to be part of this learning community because if you see my screen um, over here last time we we talked about different uh, gaps infrastructure deficits data regulation gaps high cost of internet data gender divides we still we have a lot of women not still going into the uh, stem sections in the same studies that's the science the arts and basically the digital literacy there's still a lot to be done on that gap we cannot talk about these technologies being fair and whole and also um, like without without talking about these uh, gaps and layers but at the same time we have the opportunity to map out um you know gaps in our infrastructure i know in which i kind of uh comes as it associates with one of jade's interests uh areas of interest i think uh we've been mentioning last time during our conversation um she had an interest about mapping out dead zones in um i think related to signals but before going to Jade, Sherry, have I answered your questions? Uh, my yes, short you answer did. would be yes. Yeah. Yes, you did. Um, yeah. Humans, when we remembered and stored information in our brains, we didn't have to dump a load to make space. We just retain and retain and retain. Mm -hmm. And our memory, as we got older, some of the memories that remember, like say we remembered um, st um, stories that were told to us or mm. rhymes or games. Because now I am more mature, I could eliminate that and and and, but I don't have to dump it like with the AI. Mm -hmm. It needs space, and you know you have to like my computer now is so slow because I download so much stuff, and now I don't even know how to. To, I have now I have mm -hmm. to learn to make space but with mm -hmm. with humans you know we 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 eliminate or we naturally forget or we don't need it anymore so it's not in the forefront so with 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 retaining it wasn't mm -hmm. I don't my personal view i don't think it was a negative thing um hmm. because okay in my day in school we weren't allowed to use calculators because we had to retain the formulas and by the time as i went to college we were allowed to use the ti calculators with the formula in it so was it i think ai life is already fast and ai is making it even more fast and making us more impatient mm. um so speed i think speed brings anxiety to some people and some of us work better.
better at a slower pace. So are we going to be left behind because we're at a slower pace? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to fall off for, like you were saying, um, you need to keep up with technology. Um, every, mm -hmm. is it six months you get a new phone, a new iPhone or update? Mm -hmm. Is the update better? You know, with should we limit the AI to just do cleaning instead of do war? Because in war where persons are dying, if if the other you see what I'm saying? They mm -hmm. with humans we have mm. that. Look at Nikita and see if she's having a good or bad day. The AI might have a, a limitation on um, being um, sympathetic because she's having a bad day. Because it's not, it doesn't have that, that thing that the human have. Although the AI could get a better analysis or the reason why she is how she is. I only could comfort. I, I don't need to know why. It's just because I'm human, I'm gonna and I have mm. feelings. I could comfort her. He could analyze her or give or have it. You see where I'm going? Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm getting lost in my head. But I had a thread of thought of, I just I just don't think, I think AI is going to allow some of us to have a lazy, sort of a lazy, a lazy brain or a lazy, oh, I don't need to, to know that. I can retrieve it. And when you retrieve it, like um, Nikita was saying, um, it isn't necessary to retain it. Just be, just know where to go to get what you need. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't know. Um, when it comes yeah. to AI, I think it's fascinating, but I think there should be a limit. And with humans, there is no limit. We always trying to top up the next one or there, we're just, natural competitors so if i make an ai what could go invisible you want to make one what could <laughs> go invisible plus and where's the <laughs> limit in that where's the danger where, where when do we stop where do we stop that's just mm. my thought where do we stop where do i would rather say where do we jump to so I think that's the framing of the question. Um, all of these things, Shuri, you've shared, these are the voids that we're trying to avoid, right? These are the 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 uh, limitations we need to be aware of before we even start to interact with these technologies. Because in this awareness is when we can fully utilize these technologies for the betterment of our own self and just uh, with the full awareness of where our full human essence is going to be manifested as opposed to just um you know this for example you mentioned about what's going to happen to the elderly people who are not uh you know in tune with these things in fact it's a very very important conversation we've been having in our in my organization uh, there's a lot of senior members within our um, institution, people who have, who are close to their retirement age, um, who might not necessarily be tech savvy. And there's a lot of hype on the other hand with these AI tools and, you know, the need to perfect our uh, office equipments with the latest um, software, gadgets, security, cybersecurity and all of this. And then it actually became a top management issue. 
And as much as we need to adapt new technologies, we need to be aware of how we, it's these technologies speak with elderly staff members and not leave them behind because they're very valuable community members and staff because they have institutional knowledge and they are the ones who mentor the next and they also need to be part of the team, right? So AI, if we become aware of these gaps, even AI can be part of the solution in how we design and frame the, these. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's say someone might, an elderly staff might not be equipped with logging on a pre-recorded meeting. Let's say they haven't attended a meeting and they want to refer back to that meeting and do login into the system, get the recording and all of those um, long processes. But instead, there are now AI tools that actually summarize you a meeting minutes and they're just embedded within the same. It's just a matter of telling that staff, hey, you just need to activate this function and then you have your summary. Yes, there might be some uh, uh, limitations in the details of the meetings, but still you're making it a, at least one or two steps easier for these staff members to access. The, and and it, there are some conscious move, movements being made on that. Um, so we can, it's the bottom line is understanding where this limitation is, where this parasitic host relationship is formed between technology and ourselves, and then how we can better. You said, what can we avoid? Actually, what I would say, what can we jump into to better to use these things? So I don't know if that makes sense, um, but um, I've definitely taken notes of uh, what you've shared with me. Um, and when it comes to retaining knowledge, yes, we've become a bit lazy and we've become um, and again this issue of laziness is still operating at a lower frequency of ourselves right like googling something from google and then uh, we just assume take it as it's fact right exactly like, um, you want to go and then uh, oh google, mr google said this and that and then if you do actually further do the deep search and then this is where AI now is becoming now one step upper than just a search engine. It's becoming a better way to cite and source information from different sources. Um, there's now tools even where, like when it comes to the citation I was telling you about, uh, one of the functions, these applications promises that when you extract one information, let's say you want to use, you want to quote some some author about something and then you want to also check different sources for that same information so ai actually there are some ai prompts that actually you can ask the citation or you can you can ask the different citations for that same information so that you can verify so have we perfected our have we in, improved our, how we gather information yes do we necessarily have to memorize all of that information? No. Do we have to put more time and effort to find information, that same information? Not necessarily, because that's when we now realize where we can apply the AI for better, for much more progressive use. The speed, the quantity, but not necessarily quality. That's when human ingenuity should come in. So there's a lot we can talk about these functions, about uh, AI and communication, but let me pause here. I don't know if you have enough time. Um, to Jade's uh, subject of interest, maybe on in data. Uh, I don't know, Nikita, dude, I took this from your last post um, earlier, I think from, that was really interesting. So I think they were trying to visualize where a plastic bottle that was, I think, dropped in uh, Europe, it ended up in Cat Island. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, Anthony, so are you there? We explored on- Yes, I'm here. You can give an update, that'd be great. 
on what our adventure on Sunday. Yes, the oh. one that I missed. Yeah, so we were trying to attempt to find this um bought this plastic bottle what came from I believe is Greece or Turkey one of those anyways Portugal. and we, Portugal okay I know it's somewhere in Europe or somewhere and we were not successful because the road leading to it was not good it was a bad road and it was a rental jeep so we had to abort that mission and i guess we have to think of a next day where we could go and try to locate it because where it is it's not going to be easy going on that road with the vehicle we have because the road is really really bad and the bush is growing up so much so yeah mm. So they, so this, this debris actually traveled all the way across the ocean. And yes. And it was very fascinating for me because, you know, the ocean is a very huge uh, ecological space. It's, uh, and very, it connects a lot of land masses in one. And you don't know what's happening in one end and then can end up on the other. And, you know, this kind of information, unless you keep track using more advanced technologies, it's very difficult to, let's say, I don't know, this is plastic waste, maybe it could be nuclear waste the other day, or I don't know, there's some very hazardous things going on in the ocean. But now, where does now data visualization and geospatial data come in? This is one of the topic areas we're interested in this AI, Green Lab co-creation and one of the things we've been trying to push and understand and how do we map out, uh, how do we observe our environment? How do we, you might not, you might not notice things changing in the Bed Sea or like the coastal areas or like vegetation cover. Um, just to give you an example, like um, I usually mention this example, we have a huge agricultural encroachment of our biodiversity you know, this um, uh, forest areas, but we do not necessarily know how to track and uh, prob how to measure this encroachments or like uh, we don't have the tools to observe our environment properly. And these, th these change, these changes happen gradually and you don't, you cannot observe them overnight. These are not something to be observed um, by the naked eye quickly. So, how does data um, collection of our environment help us? How do we better collect data? I know usually the Royal Ring catchers are experts in, uh, you know, are the champions in in uh, in, in collecting uh, rain data because you already have understood that it is important to own your own data and build the capacity to actually collect data. And that data being later on being pro processed for uh, better usage, but I would be more interested to to hear from Jade on since our last conversation in Cat Island. Um, is there any change in interest or any new insights um, you've managed to share or you want to share with us as it relates to data and geospatial information? Okay, um, so just to comment, here. yeah. Cool. Uh, just to comment on this project that you had on the screen just now um, with the, the yeah, model that you wanted to track, that was quite yes. interesting. Um, it would be, this would be a really cool project to do perhaps on a broader scale to even see how currents potentially move or change throughout the Bahamas. I guess that's something else that's been other other approaches to that have been mentioned previously, but um, great to see that this is something you tried to tackle. In terms of other updates relating to Cat Island, um, 
nothing that I can report on now. A lot of the information that we would be looking for in relation to z dead zones, et cetera, is kind of quasi government operations, which is not exactly direct. So um, that would have to be more of a, on the, you know, uh, in the field kind of effort as opposed to from a higher up perspective. Um, but yes, it's great to see that you included GIS aspects. Um, and perhaps there are some links that I could provide that would give you better insight on um, some of the other GIS projects that have been mapped out as it relates to environmental yeah, conservation efforts, biodiversity, et cetera. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Jay, this is really interesting. Um, this Ocean Plastic Climate Nexus project has come about because there are these European scientists that dropped these bottles, as Anthony said, into the ocean. Um, some did it during some of the COP meetings. Others did it during the UN Ocean meeting. This specific bottle was dropped in during the UN Ocean meeting. And it's washed ashore 530 days later, it washed ashore on Cat Island. So there's a really interesting opportunity here for us to do, um, so to, to better understand our relationship with plastic, um, the intersection between the ocean, plastic, and climate, um, but then also expanding the knowledge economy. And so our team, as and as she shared, um, we were out there on Sunday uh, trying to see if we could get this bottle. And so we have to now put together next steps on how to go and pick up this bottle for this, you know, to in, with this team. But I think more importantly, what I'm curious about is what are the questions that we have um, as it relates to plastic in our ocean? Knowing, right, if we know that, you know, because when I shared this with my brother, he was like, okay, so what? Like, we know plastic floats and ends up places. Like, why is this so special? Um, and it's a fair, you know, it's, it's a fair question. Um, but I think, you know, diving deeper to into the, the knowledge economy application, I think, for understanding um, just not only the movement of data, but also how we can then mobilize our community to better understand and work now in partnership with this team that's maybe in Europe, you know, and understanding um, how plastic is moving in our oceans. But of course, that's real impact, right? Because that plastic's on our beach, it's in our water. And it's not just the one bottle, it's a lot of plastic that's on that, that shore. Um, and then just to pivot to the, the dead zone project, Jade, I'd love for us to explore, you know, what are the steps? What do we need to do in order to map the dead zones? Um, and, you know, if we could come up with a step-by-step, -step, you know, this is what needs to be done on the ground, you know, so that we can then, you know, create this uh, visualize you know, visualize this data through a, a map um, to help better understand our dead zones. I think that's a super tangible outcome from, you know, this meeting of the minds that we've been cultivating here. Yeah, sounds great. Um, relating to the dead zone, I can draft something up and send along to you. Uh, it's really just about getting probably four points on both sides of the dead zone. You can just take it from the road, but just to get an idea of like the distance and then from there can work on it some more. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, I, I love this. Uh, I, lo I like how this is um, evolving. And you know, Nikita, on the, on the point you mentioned about, yes, these, uh, you might say, so what, the plastic is there. We, <laughs> one of the co-presidents, he was saying um, when he was being asked about um, 
like the recent UN climate meeting, um, they were mentioning about this global stock take, right? Basically trying to account the different progresses being made as a means of accountability of each uh, country on how much they're progressing in their re reducing emissions and also their natural capital, how much is uh, in, in terms of biocredits and uh, card markets and different things that need to be uh, counted for, right? So that there's a transparency. It's not about, we do not need in more evidence to tell you that the world is in illness or in, in sickness, or you don't need more evidence that the temperature is rising. There's already enough. But I think the shift now should be towards where is progress happening and where do we need to double down on that progress? For example, to give you, um, in UK, they had this air pollution gauging instrument where it gauges like where which areas in the UK has the most air polluted areas and therefore which areas could be mapped out to figure out more um, um you know what do you call it tree planting activities could be reinforced or afforestation pro programs could be re reinforced or at least to map out which areas um, air pollution is higher and to avoid maybe further settlement around that area or maybe uh, map out which areas the pollution is coming from. I don't know what they will do with that information later on, but the bottom line is understanding progress, observing your environment is very essential to know where you can uh, double down on your efforts. So it's not just about identifying the problems as well. But it's going to be a long way, but all we know is that data is an equalizer. Data is um, is factual. And the more we learn how to use it and the more we uh, become better in collecting it, and the more we the more we understand what what we'll be asking, like these are the main questions. whose data collected how, generated by who, processed by? which algorithm and analyze for who. If we can answer these questions in our reflection, I think that would be a nice uh, point to stop here for our next uh, session. Um, looking forward to Jade's, any if it's, if it's a half page or like anything you'd like to share in written form, that would be nice so that we can have a thought pattern to follow like a, <laughs> So that we can build our own AI system for tracking our own knowledge production, right? And okay. uh, that would be nice. Sure. And yeah, let me pause here if there's any point for questions, reflections, anything, um, any AOB. That would be nice. Just, just a thought um, relating to the plastic bottle. I'm sure that there may be some projects done in terms of tracking uh, garbage, especially for Southeast Asia, including India. And uh, in some instances, there's a challenge with um, the municipality infrastructure set up um, for the plastic boom that has happened in Asia. So in a lot of communities, they're not as familiar with the concept of an organized waste disposal system. Um, and as a result, there's a ton of plastic waste that ends up on the beaches and on the coastlines throughout Southeast Asia. So I'm just thinking in terms of migration and tracking of plastic waste um, with ocean currents, et cetera, there may be some projects already done on that, but yeah. Interesting, we were definitely going to connect. What I'm going to try and arrange, um, so if anyone wants to join, um, is to set up a call with our community scientists, um, invite Crystal Ambrose from Bahamas Plastic Movement, and then also these researchers in Europe. 
just so that we can, I think it would be nice for us to learn more about the the objectives of their, you know, their research, especially from a climate perspective. Um, you know, so I'm hoping that we can arrange a conversation to make that happen. And um, I think that then could be the platform for, you know, whether it's looking at comparative things or, you know, just figuring out where, where do we go from here or what are those questions that we want to ask? And maybe even the questions that, you know, the, the scientists in Europe were asking may not be the questions that we actually have here. You know, so I think having that type of discourse could be really interesting. Awesome. Super. Well, um, did we have any other remarks that people want to share? I am sensitive to the time. Um, yeah, thanks for the um, education on AI. Most of the time when we're lacking knowledge, we become frightened. So I really appreciate um, the education that I am obtaining concerning these um, Zoom meetings. So I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate that. And um, so this is not the definitely the end of, of these conversations, of course. So for today, I have one suggestion uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, most of these AI machine learning. Uh, for your general curiosity, there are very many free courses out there, but I'll particularly recommend one by Andrew Ng. He's like the almost the godfather of AI, but he's been very... Uh, good in he's a Stanford lecturer but he's been availing his um, courses online for people to use for free so he believes he's one of the advocates of AI for good and really trying to democratize the the knowledge within the system because this knowledge should be an equalizer for everyone uh, just like the same mistake, mistake we've made in the industrial revolution trying to uh, just make certain amount of power resources available for certain companies and then we monetize those and then we ended up in this conundrum that we are in this getting stuck in this uh, energy crisis that we are in today being too dependent on fossil fuels is actually a result of not being transparent and open in how we leverage on new discoveries or new technologies and then we limit them to a very specific group of people or industries and then we end up in this uh, uh, club but now uh, we shouldn't be doing the same thing we should be more proactive and tap into the more um, the more progressive applications of AI and more inclusive ones one that does not leave behind, one that does not is that's not too dependent on barriers, and um, yeah. So I'll just leave it here. That's one recommendation. The other is um, for the next session, uh, we will have one guest speaker. Um, um, so we'll share the details more on um, as as of by around Friday or like the weekend. And if there are reflections you want to do, if you can just go back to your email, there is a Google Doc link um, that you can check and you can drop your reflections anytime during during the week. Uh, then that's that would be really helpful. And yeah, um, Nikita, anything, any other thing? Any what other was that name? Andrew what? Remember? Andrew NG, uh, let me just share the link of the course. Andrew NG. Thank you. I'll just drop the Coursera link. Uh, While you do that, Abby, I'm just going to thank everyone for joining us um, again for another AI Green Lab session. I think each of these conversations are really uh, just packed with 
insights and so much to take away. Um, they are a deep dive. So if you made it this far, celebrate uh, your stickability and your learning because, um, you know, it's a lot to, to take in. But I think when we learn in community, it makes it um, better. And it allows us to sort of walk more confidently into these new spaces and be able to use these tools where they can benefit us, de demystify some of the stigma associated with them, but then also just be cognizant of the realities in what we're living in. And you know, there are there are a lot of intersections with AI and everything. And I think we talked a lot about that today, whether it was AI and its application for drone war war warfare or AI and communication, AI for you know science and improving our understandings of a plastic bottle even floating in the ocean. So there's many different ways that we can utilize these AI tools. Um, and I'm just so grateful that we have had this opportunity to continue the conversation. So we will see you next week. For those of you who will be joining us live, I look forward to seeing you in Zoomland. Other than that, have a wonderful evening. And um, yeah, we'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nikita. Great yeah. presentation.